I mean, you've probably seen it like a hundred times already, but what exactly is a neural network? Like, why is it that it's a bunch of circles and lines? How do we even get here? Well, if we search it up, apparently it is a computer system modeled on the human brain and nervous system, but modeled on the human brain and nervous system? What the fuck does that even mean? Well, this is what the fundamental building block of what a brain looks like. It's a neuron, if you can't tell. It has a huge bulge over here called the cell body, and this long part here is called the axon. On the big bulge, there's a bunch of tentacles called dendrites. And similarly, there's also some tentacles on the end of the long axon called the telodendria. So anyways, if we have two neurons near each other, the first one's telodendria will attach to the second one's dendrites. If we have multiple, this is what it would look like. Loads of axons will go to the cell body. Now, how these work exactly is still not fully understood, but from what we know, it seems like when one fires, it sends a signal down its axon to the other neuron's dendrites. And if there's a load of different neurons firing and there's enough accumulated signal, then that neuron would light up and send its signals to other neurons. But how does all of this relate to a computer system anyway? Remember, Google's definition is a computer system modeled on the human brain. Well, all our modern computer systems are based on a standard blueprint called the von Neumann architecture. There's an input, which could be a mouse, a keyboard, or even a simple switch. There's also an output, which could be a display, a speaker, or something as simple as an LED light that turns on and off. And between these two is a central processing unit, AKA the CPU. And we also need some memory as well to store instructions and data, which is just the RAM. Now, if we take a look with a super powerful magnifying glass, we'll see that the CPU is made up of tiny repeating arrangements of transistors. These special arrangements, also known as logic gates, are the fundamental building blocks of all computer systems we use today. Oh, and this is how big the coronavirus would be if we zoomed in by the same amount. Anyways, there's quite a few different logic gates that exist. There's AND, OR, NOT, NAND, NOR, XOR, etc. But the most simple and essential ones are just the AND gate, the OR gate, and the NOT gate. With just these three gates, you can combine them in different configurations to make all of the other logic gates. And in turn, you can combine those to make more complex components like latches, for example, for storing information and ALUs for performing mathematical calculations. So how the logic gates work is you have inputs and outputs, which can either be turned on or off, one or zero. For the OR gate, the output will turn on if either one of the inputs are on. And for the AND gate, the output will only turn on if both inputs are on. Now, for the NOT gate, this one only has one input and one output. And for this gate, the output will always show the opposite of the input. If the input is on, then the output will be off. And if it is off, then the output will turn on. Now, in practice, logic gates will always need power in order to turn on the output. For the AND gate and the OR gate, that power directly comes from the inputs being on. But for the NOT gate, well, you can't really have the output be on if there's no power coming in from the input. So this means when we implement a NOT gate in real life, it will actually need two inputs. One of them will deliver power, and this one will be the input signal. Now, if we go back to the neuron diagrams and we put them side by side with the logic gates, it kind of looks similar, right? Sort of. Well, how about this? Let's simplify it. We'll just represent the cell bodies using circles, and let's just stick with straight lines for the dendrite connections. And even though most of the details are now gone, the general shape still remains. But now if we compare again, the resemblance is a lot clearer, right? We've got two inputs and one output, just like the logic gates. In fact, we have just recreated the simplest neural network in the world, the perceptron. Okay, fine. If that's where the lines and circles of a neural network comes from, that's where they come from. But what does any of that have to do with logic gates? Well, as it turns out, perceptrons can actually function as logic gates themselves. Here, you can see an interactive demonstration of a perceptron network that I coded up in TypeScript. How this works is the following. Over here, for the inputs, to keep it simple, I've set them so that they can only take on binary values of either zero or one. And these lines over here can be dragged to change the strength of each connection. You can see if I drag the line up and down, it changes the weight value. Negative values turns it red and positive values turns it green. Now, if I switch the inputs on, it lights up and the signal value one gets multiplied by the weight value here and the result gets accumulated in this neuron along with the signal value that came from this input. Right now, these are just two inputs, but you can imagine if we had a bigger network, this process would be happening for lots and lots of neurons as well, which I'll show you in just a little bit. But first, what happens with the final total of all of the values that get added together here? Well, remember in the beginning when I said that for the neurons in your brain, if one neuron gets enough accumulated signal, then that neuron will also light up and send 
its signals to other neurons downstream of it. Well, the same thing happens here. For this neuron, I've actually gave it a threshold value of zero, which means that if the total from the results of these two connections gets summed up together and that value is bigger than zero, then it will allow that signal to flow through to the output neuron, as long as it's not blocked by this connection over here. So I'll just turn that up to one. Now, whenever the middle neuron lights up, this output neuron will also light up as well. However, if the total is below zero at this neuron, like if we turn everything off, then nothing goes through. By the way, in machine learning speak, this threshold is actually called the Rayleigh activation function. But anyways, now let's say I turn up this connection weight. So every one of them is set to positive one. If either input gets turned on, the output also gets turned on, which is just like how the OR gate behaves. Next, for the NOT gate, it's pretty simple as well. All we do is lower this weight value down to negative one, and just like the two inputs in the NOT gate, we can treat this bottom one as the power, and this top one as the signal. So right now it's off, whilst the output is on, and when we turn it on, the output flips. And lastly, for the AND gate, this one will need to be slightly different. If you just try and adjust the weight, you'll eventually find that it's actually impossible to simulate the AND gate perfectly with just this current setup. And the reason is because of, well, maths. Basically, if we were to try and make this work in our current setup, we would need two values that add up to be higher than zero, but both individually being a negative number. And that's just not possible since two negative numbers can't ever add up to be a positive number. However, if we make a slight tweak to the network, we can actually make this work. Right now, our threshold value is at zero. But if we shift that threshold value up to some positive number, like one, we can then set all the weights back up to one as well, making it look like our previous OR gate configuration. But the difference is that now, since the threshold needs a higher value in order to turn on the neuron, switching on one input won't be enough. And so with this configuration, it becomes an AND gate because we need to switch on both inputs in order to turn on this middle neuron and therefore the output as well. Now, the official name for this slight tweak to the threshold value is actually called a bias. However, strictly speaking, this bias value isn't absolutely necessary. If we were to increase this middle part to three neurons instead of one, then with this configuration of weights, even though there's no bias value, it can still work as an AND gate. You can see if I turn on both inputs, the output turns on, and if either one of the inputs is turned off, the output turns off as well. So now that we can create single logic gates using perceptron networks, if we scale up the neural networks, then you can kind of imagine it like stacking multiple layers of logic gates together. They won't always be the AND gate, the OR gate, and the NOT gate. The connection weights allow for a lot more flexibility than that. But regardless, you can think of them like simple decision-making units. The inputs and outputs can represent almost anything. For example, individual pixel brightness values for image recognition, the index values of tokens from a list or dictionary, or even numerical values of stock price over time. The more layers a neural network has, the more degrees of freedom it also has, with each additional layer capable of making deeper and more nuanced decisions. Similarly, for a computer system that uses logic gates, you don't actually have to run it on any particular hardware. You can build computers with Minecraft, with Terraria, and even with marbles and dominoes. All a computer system is, at the end of the day, is just a system based on Boolean logic and a series of rules. And that's kind of also the case with neural networks as well. Sure, a neural network has to generally run on some sorts of a computer system, but it doesn't have to be a digital system. In fact, the earliest perceptrons and neural networks were run on analog circuitry, using resistors, capacitors, and potentiometers. The only real difference, I would say, is that with digital logic, every single logic gate has one job, whereas the fundamental component of a neural network can be adapted to have multiple different functions. Also, with regular logic gates, the job of designing them into more complex architectures and components has largely been the responsibility of humans. We have to manually solve the Boolean equations to map a specific set of inputs to a certain set of outputs, whereas with artificial neural networks, we can use a simple algorithm called backpropagation, which is basically a fancier version of trial and error, and it can automatically adjust its own connection strengths, thereby, in some sense, program itself. Although, in reality, it's still very inefficient. As a comparison, human brains run on 20 watts of power. That's about as much electricity as a MacBook needs to play this YouTube video. Our thinking speed is about 3,000 words per minute, which means that if we had a continuous internal monologue in our heads 24-7, from the moment we're born to the time we're adults, we generate about 3 billion words. GPT-4, on the other hand, was trained on a whole data center worth of GPUs and consumed about 13 trillion tokens worth of text. If each year was a human lifetime, then a human lifetime worth of lifetimes would not even be enough to think that many words. And yet after all of that, it still struggles with basic logical reasoning. In other words, AI may become better than us in most aspects, but likely not gonna be in every aspect.